you today. And and Sarah is um, has recently successfully defended her PhD project here at North Carolina State University, and she was researching the effectiveness of biomass harvesting guidelines on sustaining small mammal, reptile, and amphibian populations. So she's currently finishing up her dissertation, and what she's going to present to you today are um, results and op. Uh, observations and implications from this this research. She got an MS in Natural Resource and Environmental Science at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and her BS in Wildlife Biology and Management from the University of Georgia. And she's currently living in Austin, Texas and she's getting married next weekend which is very exciting that she still made time to do a webinar for us. So um, Sarah, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you now. Okay, can you hear me, Susan? Hear you just fine. Okay, great. Yeah, welcome everyone to the webinar today. Um, I'll be talking about the effects of woody biomass harvesting guidelines on reptile, amphibian, and shrew populations. As Susan mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate, and I worked under my advisors, Drs. Christopher Mormon and Dennis Hazel, and also my other committee members, uh, Dr. Stephen Castleberry, Jessica Homiak, and Ken Pollock. Okay. So the definition of woody biomass, um, it can mean a lot of different things. For us, it was logging residues, and that was because we worked in wildlife pine plantations. So our logging residues were small diameter trees, uh, small diameter pines and hardwoods, and also undesirable species, such as hardwoods. Um, these were all wildlife pine plantations, and also the tops and limbs of trees. And you can take a look at the picture here in the bottom left-hand corner. This is an on-site chipper that's taken through the tops and limbs of some of the trees and making uh, wood chips, which you can see in the middle picture, that can then be chipped and burned, which is considered a renewable resource. Woody biomass also can be put into pellets, as you can see on the right picture. And um, these are really common in the northeastern United States and also in Europe. And the southeast, southeastern United States is currently the largest exporter of pellets in the world. Um, and relatively recently, Woody biomass also has been able to be transformed into a liquid transportation fuel. Okay. However, for us, woody biomass also provides a lot of ecosystem services. And in the environmental world, we usually consider this down woody material or down woody debris. So throughout the presentation, I'll switch between woody biomass and down woody material or down woody debris. And it's all the same thing. It's just wood that's on the forest floor. And that wood material provides several ecosystem services. For one, it is important for, um, for nutrient cycling. And as woody biomass decays, it releases nutrients back into the soil. And that can be important for site productivity. Woody biomass also is important for erosion control. This is one of our sites after a heavy rain event. And the wood on the ground actually stabilizes the soil to keep it from being eroded away. And what we're going to talk about today is wildlife use of woody biomass. A lot of different critters use woody debris for a lot of different reasons. Um, you can often find nests, such as salamander nests, inside decaying logs or underneath logs. Woody debris also harvests a variety of insects, and all three of the taxa we'll talk about today um, eat insects, so you can often find them foraging around woody debris. It can also be used for travel and escape cover. You can see a shrew here in the bottom left corner um, eating a piece of carrion by a, by a downed log. You can use that log to get away from predators if a predator shows up. You can also find uh, a lot of animals using it for mating, such as lizards, calling, are displaying on logs and for thermal regulation. So for reptiles, that means basking on woody debris. And for shrews and amphibians, it means maybe hiding under woody debris to prevent desiccation. So as we all know, there's an increased demand for all renewable energy sources, including woody biomass. And this is in the United States and abroad. So Many states and uh, NGOs have developed biomass harvesting guidelines, and basically these are just voluntary recommendations that typically include a target retention volume of downwoody material that should be re retained after woody biomass harvest. 
However, a lot of biomass harvesting guidelines vary in their recommended target volume of woody debris. So, for example, there is one state that um, that recommends retaining 15 to 30 percent of woody debris on the forest floor, while another state recommends leaving 10 percent of logging residues. So, one of the, the purpose of, woody, of biomass harvesting guidelines is to conserve wildlife habitat and also site productivity. However, there's not been any operational scale response or research on wildlife response to biomass harvesting guidelines. So we're not sure if they're really, um, if the wildlife is responding to this in a positive or negative way, and um, if, they're, if they're basically doing their job at sustaining wildlife populations. So researchers at North Carolina State University partnered with researchers at Georgia in the Forest Guild and came up with this very large scale project of um, biomass harvesting guidelines. Um, I'll be talking about the wildlife response, but it's a, it's a project that has other uh, facets to it as well. And we, our study sites are on Warehouser land, Plum Creek land, and Georgia Pacific land. And we were funded, as Susan mentioned, by USDA NISA and also the National Council for Air and Stream Improvement, the Biofield Center of North Carolina, and the Department of Interior Southeast Climate Science Center. So I came on board to look at the reptile, amphibian, and small animal response to which biomass harvesting guidelines and came up with some research questions, which basically were do downloading material volume and allocation. And what I mean by allocation is a spatial allocation. So some biomass harvesting guidelines recommend retaining debris in discrete piles throughout the site, while other biomass harvesting guidelines recommend retaining debris spread evenly throughout the site. So that's what I mean by allocation. So do volume and allocation of woody debris affect species diversity and abundance? And given that the effect exists, I wanted to know if biomass harvesting guidelines mitigate any potential negative consequences of woody biomass harvest. And then while we're doing this, we're also trying to identify to some degree a threshold um, of downloading material ne that's necessary for sustaining wildlife to see if one exists, if a threshold exists. However, I also did a couple of side projects, and those are both dealing with southern toads, and we wanted to know if southern toads select downloading material um, over other habitat variables or characteristics. So this presentation is going to be broken down into two parts. First, we're going to talk about the operational level response. And here, we're going to I'll talk about true reptile and amphibian response to our operational scale biomass harvesting guidelines. And then part two of the talk is going to be downwardy material selection by southern toads. So we'll start with the operational response. We had a randomized complete block experimental design with four replicates in North Carolina and another four in Georgia. These were all in the coastal plain regions and were intensively managed lava pine plantations. And in each of these replicates, um, there were six treatments. And these treatments basically varied in the volume of downwoody material that was retained. And each of the treatments were six to 14 hectares. So you can see here in North Carolina, our sites were on Beaufort County. And in Georgia, we have some sites near Brunswick and also a site near Savannah. So all of these sites were clear-cut harvested. So just always keep that in mind. Um, they were clear-cut for round wood, which included saw timber and pulp wood, while simultaneously receiving the treatment implementation of the woody biomass harvest as well. In each one of the replicates, there were six treatments. And again, these were between 6 and 14 hectares each. So they're pretty large-scale treatments. We'll start with the no biomass harvesting guidelines, which is in the top right corner. So this treatment, we basically just told loggers to take that what they would typically take in a woody biomass harvest. So it was harvested for round wood, and then also had the woody biomass harvest, complete woody biomass harvest. And it's dictated here by a couple pieces of wood on the, um, on the screen because it was pretty, um, it basically a lot of just couldn't take all of the woody debris. It was impractical 
whether it's through mechanical or economic reasons, so there's still some wing debris that was retained on the fourth floor. And the opposite of that kind of was the no biomass harvest. So basically there was still clear cut and ground wood harvested, but all merchantable woody biomass was retained on the forest floor. And the other four treatments were split evenly between 30% retention and 15% retention. So we had a 30 to 15 um, percent retention with the debris dispersed. And so that meant that debris, we asked the loggers to leave the debris spread evenly throughout the site. And then we also had cluster treatments where we asked the loggers to leave the debris in large discrete piles throughout the sites. And I'll draw your attention to the, um, to the light green boxes here. And what those indicate is how we implemented our treatments. I think there's already been, or I know there's already been a webinar a little bit on this, but for those that didn't attend that webinar, we used a retention area-based implementation method where we actually used ArcGIS to identify either 30% or 15% of the area of each treatment unit. And then we flagged that boundary and loggers um, harvested all of the roundwood and woody biomass from the non-retention area and then entered the retention area harvested all of the roundwood out of that, but retained the woody biomass, and then used the woody biomass from that area to implement the treatments throughout the entire treatment unit. So just to give you a little idea of what these sites look like, this is one of our North Carolina sites. This site had no woody biomass harvest. So you can see here in the foreground, there are some large, almost whole trees um, somewhat small diameter, probably hardwood trees that are left lying on the ground. Here in the background, there's some larger piles of trees that were retained on the forest floor. And this was in 2011. This is year one post-harvest. So the vegetation structure has not become very well established. We just have a little bit of vegetation here. And this is another um, picture of, a, of one of the treatments with no woody biomass harvest. So sometimes the debris was left in large piles, as you can see here. And you can compare that to a treatment unit with no biomass harvesting guidelines. So again, here, we just told loggers to take what they would normally take in a woody biomass harvest. So as you can see, there's still quite a bit of debris that's left on the forest floor, but it's typically small diameter and a little bit shorter than some of the full large trees in the, in the other treatments. Another thing I want to mention is <clears throat> the Georgia sites and the North Carolina sites had different site preparation activities. In North Carolina, the immediately following harvest, all of the sites were V-sheared. So basically, they, um, the loggers went in and used a big V-shear, which pushed all the debris into long linear debris rows and left these inner bed rows that are about 20 feet apart um, from middle row to middle row. Uh, for, for bedding and planting, which occurred year two post-harvest. So site preparation happened immediately following harvest, and then we sampled for one year, and then bedding and planting occurred, and then we sampled for two more years. So the schedule was the same in Georgia. The, the site preparation happened immediately following harvest. However, the, what happened was a little bit different. In Georgia, instead of V-sharing, they windrowed and spot piled. So basically, instead of having these debris rows that are, you know, 15 feet apart from each other or 20 feet apart from each other, they had large debris rows and wind rows with vast areas of bare ground in between. So then we, we captured reptiles, amphibians, and small mammals using drift fence arrays. And for those of you that aren't familiar with those, the drift fence arrays, basically, you use silt fencing, the same kind of material found at construction sites, and you bury that down into the ground. And we used a Y-shaped array. So basically we had three arms that were each 25 feet or 7.6 meters long in a Y formation. And at each end of the, of the arm, we had a bucket that was buried flush with the ground. And then we used the bucket lid to provide shade. Also in the middle of each of the why is there a bucket, or in uh, one-third of the traps, we also had a big funnel trap, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. 
So we trapped for three years from April through August in 2011 and 2013. Again, this was year one post-harvest and post-shearing and wind rowing, and then for two years after bedding and planting. And we had three drip fence arrays per treatment unit. And so one of those arrays had a um, box trap in the middle, which is shown here, instead of a bucket. And the reason for this is because larger body snakes can, can easily escape out of the bucket. Uh, some of your larger frogs can also escape. So to get a complete or a more complete inventory, we use a different trapping method that could trap, uh, capture more species. So we also did a lot of different habitat measurements. The first one we did was we wanted to estimate the volume of woody debris in each of the treatment units. Uh, so to do that, we used two different methods. The first was a line intersect method. And to do this, we had nine points in each of our treatment units. We went to each of the points and then pulled a transect, um, three transects at 120 degrees apart from one another. They were 24 feet in length. And basically walked those transects and any piece of debris, we, had a, we used a rope, and any piece of debris that crossed the transect, uh, we tallied. And we then um, average this across the nine sites in each treatment unit and expanded it to get your meters cubed per hectare. However, while we were out there, because these areas had already been sheared and some of the site preparation had started, um, the, the tiles were somewhat left in these long linear rows, which always, which shouldn't always match up with our number of, or with our sites for the line intersect method. So I decided to get a more complete inventory. We wanted to actually locate, visually locate every single woody debris pile out on the landscape and measure it. So here you can see us measuring the length, we did a width, height, and packing ratio, and um, then added that to our line intersect method. So our line intersect method um, measured more of the scattered woody debris, and then the other method, the visual encounter method, measured our piled woody debris. And then we added these to each other. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an idea about the treatments and if they worked, here's this slide. This is from the North Carolina treatments only. Um, the light pink is pine debris, and the, the darker red is hardwood debris. And you can see we start with the no biomass harvesting guideline treatment, and uh, this is the volume in meters cubed per hectare volume of debris that was retained on the forest floor. So. Um, you can see that it increases with the 15 cluster, increases again with the 30 dispersed, and then again with the no biomass harvest. So what that's telling you is actually the treatment implementation works pretty well in North Carolina. I don't have a graph here of Georgia. Um, Georgia was a little bit more difficult to estimate because there was a lot more woody debris, a lot greater volumes overall that were retained. So picking out the, the amount of volume that was retained for our for our treatment implementation was actually pretty much masked by all the debris that was retained on the site. So that was for the entire treatment unit. So it's a volume of woody debris in each treatment unit at a treatment unit scale. But I also wanted to do some finer scale um, habitat estimates. So to do that, we looked at uh, habitat around each drift fence array. So remember, there's three drift fence arrays in each of the treatment units. So we looked at the volume of downwind material within 50 meters of the drift fence array. And we also measured the distance of each drift fence array to the nearest debris pile and the uh, distance to the nearest ditch. So in North Carolina, there were longitudinal ditches throughout each of the treatment units. And each of the replicates was surrounded by a ditch uh, for drainage purposes. While in Georgia, there were somewhat wet, unharvested depressions that were retained on the site. And so for Georgia, we measured the distance to those wetland depressions. So this was what our sites basically looked like in 2011. You can see there's not much vegetation. Um, and they did herbicide in 2011 and then herbicide it again in 2012. But in 2013, vegetation cover became very well established. Um, and at that point, the, the seedling pines had had one growing season. 
So in 2013, we also estimated the vegetation of vertical structure and ground cover at each strip fence array. So to do that, we went to each strip fence array, um, which is here in the black, that's our Y strip fence array. And then for the vegetation, we, we put in transects that are 10 meters long. And at each one meter increment, we had a two meter high pole. And we, we, we put the pole basically at each of the one meter increment points and tallied um, all, the, all the points on the pole that the vegetation touched. So this was just an index of vegetation structure. And then we averaged that vegetation structure over the 30 points for the entire drip fence array. Also, we had, um, when we put the pole at each point, this was about a two and a half inch diameter PVC pipe. So we also recorded each of the ground covers types that the bottom of the pole touched. And then we averaged that over the 30 sites and got a percent ground cover for each strip fence array. So for this, we divided ground cover into coarse 40 degree, which is basically just, we defined it as downwitting material that had um, a diameter of at least three inches for a minimum of three feet, fine woody debris, which was just any debris that's smaller than coarse woody debris, herbaceous vegetation, bare ground, and woody vegetation. And then we did some statistical analyses. Um, and this should actually be statistical analyses for all three types and not just shrews. Sorry about that. But we had two different scales in our statistics as well. So we have our treatment level responses. And with that, we're just asking the basic questions. Do the treatments differ in, one, the relative abundance of shrews, and the relative abundance is simply the number of captures per unit effort. And do the treatments differ in the species diversity of amphibians and reptiles? So with the treatment level responses, we do not have any of the habitat or the downwind material or vegetation um, estimates within those, those responses. But then we also wanted to get the finer scale response to see how these um, habitat measurements affect the true amphibian and reptile. So for that, we looked at uh, drift fence level responses. So here, our question was, do downwind material or vegetation structure and composition affect the number of true captures and amphibian and reptile abundance? So for these, you'll see here, we have when there's 100 captures per state per year. And that's because these are just a little bit more powerful statistical analyses where we had to have a minimum number. And these are just natural breaks in the data. So for shrews, we use when there is 100 captures per state per year, and amphibians when there's 200 captures per state per year. And I'm not going to go into the nitty-gritty statistics today, um, but if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer any of the statistical questions after the presentation. So in all, we had um, over 43,000 trap nights. So that was just the number of buckets sampled across both states in all three years. And we had over 1,200 true captures of three species, 171 reptile captures of 21 species, and nearly 8,000 amphibian captures of 18 species. Again, that's in both states on all three years. The first I'm going to go through the shrew results. Um, and see here the three species were Blyana carolinensis, Cryptotus parva, and Sorexon gerostris. Uh, these are the 2011 results. And so you can see we captured actually zero shrews in Georgia in 2011 and 50 in North Carolina in all. Um, but those, well, at least in North Carolina, the capture has increased dramatically in 2012 and um, a little bit in Georgia as well. We had two captures in Georgia. And in 2013, um, captures pretty much skyrocketed. They doubled in North Carolina and um, exploded in Georgia. And I'm going to come back to why I think that is um, towards in, a, in a little bit. So for the treatment level responses, so again, here we're just asking, are the treatments different in the relative abundance of shrews? And this is for North Carolina, this slide. And for all shrew species combined, Lyon carolinensis and Cryptotus parva. Um, this is the short-tailed shrew, the leaf shrew, and the southeastern shrew. The answer for the first three was no. The treatments were not different. Um, none of the treatments 
differed from each other at all. For uh, Lagerostris, we did have, um, in 2012 in North Carolina, the no biomass harvest treatment did have more, a higher or greater relative abundance than the 15 dispersed treatment. In Georgia, we see very similar results. So the treatments were not different with shrews, all shrews combined, um, B. carolinensis or Cryptotus parva. Here we see another um, reaction or response for S for source monstrous, but in this one, actually the no biomass harvesting guidelines, so that's the treatment where all the woody um, biomass was harvested, was actually 20 times greater than 30 dispersed. So although Silicosomonas rostris did have responses in both states, they were very different um, depending on the state. And here we're looking at the treatment level response, and this is for the herpetofauna. And here we're looking at diversity. So combined diversity, reptile diversity, and amphibian diversity. And here there are no treatment level responses um, or state level responses, except that Georgia had about 1.4 times greater amphibian diversity than North Carolina. Okay, so I mentioned we did some finer scale habitat selection. And so this slide is just showing you the ones I'm going to show today um, for, for some of the statistical analysis I did for, for the drift fence level scale. Um, so we have a couple in North Carolina and one in Georgia. So basically these analyses included the volume of woody debris in the treatment unit, the distance of the drift fence array to each woody debris pile, the volume of debris within 50 meters of the drift fence array, the distance to the closest water source, uh, vegetation vertical structure, and all the ground cover covariates in these models. Um, so, and then the graphs I'll show you are the ones that are significant. So for combined shrew captures in North Carolina in 2013, we actually saw that shrew uh, captures increased as their ground increased and actually decreased there's a negative relationship between the volume of woody material within 50 meters of the drift fence array and shrew captures. So we thought this was kind of interesting um, and not really what we'd expect if the shrews were highly linked to down woody material. And here's the combined shrew captures for Georgia in 2013. You can see we have two positive responses. They're both vegetation characteristics. Here's a woody vegetation ground cover, positive relationship with that, and also vertical vegetation structure. Then we have leaf litter, uh, negative relationships with leaf litter ground cover and herbaceous ground cover. So again, although we included the down woody material characteristics into these models, um, they did not show up as significant predictors of shrew captures. Only the vegetation characteristics were significant. So then we also did um, science scale modeling with amphibians and reptiles, but here we have the cutoff of at least 200 captures in a year and in a state. So we only need two species that met that criteria. And those were the southern toad, um, here shown as in the picture, and we had almost 5,000 captures of southern toad. So that was by far our most commonly captured species. It actually comprised about 60% of all reptile and amphibian captures. And then our next, uh, next most common species captured was the eastern Naranoff toad, Gastrophyne carolinensis. And here we had over 2,000 captured, and they comprised um, about 27% of total reptile and amphibian captures. So together, that's almost 90% of our captures were two species. So in Cyrus terrestris, this is again your southern toad. We ran some pretty sophisticated models to look at their abundance. Um, these also incorporated detection probability and found that actually none of the woody material estimates, um, volume estimates, nor the vegetation uh, structure or composition estimates were predictors of southern toads in Georgia or North Carolina. Um, for eastern narrowmouth toad, which is Gastrophyne carolinensis, we found no significant predictors of abundance in North Carolina. However, there was one significant predictor, or two significant predictors in 2012, 
Um, so there's actually no predictions of abundance in Georgia in 2011 or 2013. Um, these were some preliminary results and have since done some more sophisticated analyses and found that they actually did respond, had a positive relationship with the volume of weighted debris in the treatment unit um, and, and eastern air mouth side abundance. But again, this is an only in Georgia and only for one year in 2012. And then we had a negative relationship with distance to wet area, which makes sense. Um, the further you get, the, the, the lower the abundance of eastern air mouth side. So just kind of a um, discussion about this, we had basically we didn't really see any of the ground dwelling wildlife the, uh, respond to the current levels of biomass harvest, you know, other than gastrophyne carolinensis, which had one positive response, but that was for one state in one year. And it seemed that many of these species, particularly the shrews, were more associated with vegetation. And I'll revisit these discussion points um, at the end of the presentation in a little bit more detail. So now we'll do part two of the presentation, which is southern toad habitat selection. So here we really wanted to know, are southern toads using downwoody material? And to do that, we used two approaches and looked at uh, multi-scale use of downwoody material by toads. So our two approaches were we used a mesocosm study. And a mesocosm is just, uh, just an enclosure study, a, a medium scale uh, size enclosure study, and a radio telemetry study. So we wanted to know if toads use or select downwind material for daytime refuge, and also if they select downwind material during nocturnal hours. So here's the mesocosm. Um, you can see the, the border of it here. The entire thing is 8 meters squared by 8 meters squared. Um, the enclosure is built of silt fence material. It's pretty large silt fence material, 3 feet high or maybe 4 feet high. And within the enclosure, there are actually four treatments. So you can see here, this is a treatment that has a big pile of woody debris. And here's one with a little bit smaller pile of woody debris. And here we have a dispersed um, treatment. So the woody debris covers the same amount of area, ground area, as this, but it's, it's dispersed, uh, just kind of spread throughout the treatment. And then a treatment with no woody debris. Um, Vegetation was removed weekly from this, so we really just wanted to look at our toes selecting uh, the treatments with woody debris or no woody debris or some woody debris. And you can see there's no barriers between the, treatment, the treatments at all, um, just these stakes. And instead, we had um, a schematic. So instead of a barrier, there's actually a wire. And it's just a little 10-gauge uh, wire and it lied on the floor, the forest floor. And so it's very easy for the toes to cross. It's very small. So each treatment was surrounded by a wire, and then the wires were connected to a tuner box, and the tuner box was connected to this HDX reader. Um, and the idea was that we would, let's see, here's the HDX reader. So that's how it's all connected, and it's powered by a couple of marine batteries. So we glued, well, we glued a pit tag on the back of the southern toad using a medical grade glue and released the toad into the middle of the enclosure. So the idea was that when the toad actually crosses one of the antennas, um, it picks up the information on the time of day, the date, and the toad number and sends it to this HDX reader and logs it there. So with that information, I could determine the total amount of time that each toad spent in each treatment. And I can also look at whether they were moving, when they were moving, and, um, and the, if, it was, if it was during the night or during the day. So the southern toads are nocturnal, and this experiment com completely um, justifies that because we could tell actually when the toads basically wake up at night. I now know through this that toads became active between about 8.45 and 9 p.m. every night. That's when they started getting hits on the antennas. And then, um, you know, kind of hit out for the day between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. and didn't move again until the following night. <clears throat> so again, I'm not going to go into the exact statistical analyses I did, but I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Um, for all three years, so we did this experiment in 2011, 2012, and 2013. 
In all three years, we had 74 toads that had successful trials, enclosure trials, and we did see evidence of habitat selection. Toads were actually using this large woody debris pile treatment during the day. So it was obvious they're kind of hiding under there probably to prevent desiccation. While during the night when they're out foraging, they're actually foraging in the area with no woody debris more often than the other two treatments. So the second uh, side project I did, this was only in 2013, I did radio telemetry on southern toads. So here um, is a female. Radio telemetry was only conducted on females because they're a bit larger than, and they can actually carry the, the radio better. Um, but we custom made these little belts of silicone and fishing wire, threaded it through the, the, um, the transmitter, and went out there and got, um, got daily locations both during the day and during the night for, for these female southern toads. So what we did here was a little bit different. Um, well, it's a little bit fine, definitely finer scale than the mesocosm study. So when we found the toad, we would actually place this, um, this habitat square around the toad. So the toad would be in the middle, but well, it would actually hop away, but we would do it afterwards. And then we would quantify or estimate the, the ground cover. And here we, we divided ground cover into bare ground, coarse woody debris, fine woody debris, forest grass, woody vegetation, and sanding water. And so for each toad location, we did this. And then we also used a paired random location with no toad and got the same estimates. So basically our question was, are toads using these habitat characteristics differently than they're randomly available in the landscape. And um, in 2013, we had uh, 50 toads that we performed radio telemetry on, and we acquired 2 to 16 locations per toad, an average of a little bit over 5. And that was before uh, toads were depredated or they moved on a site. Um, and we couldn't find them. But I think mostly they were just, they were eaten. We found a lot that were eaten by hognose snakes and other, um, other snakes. So during the night, we found that toads were using coarse weight debris. So basically, this is a beta value graph. So on the bottom here are, are our um, covariates that we're looking at, our ground cover covariates. And if the line crosses the zero line, then it's not considered significant. But if it doesn't cross, it is significant. So you can see here, coarse woody debris was highly significant. Um, that means that toads were selecting coarse woody debris during nocturnal hours. And they were avoiding, because this is below the zero line, so they were avoiding grass and bare ground during nocturnal hours. However, during the day, and again, these toads are not moving around during the day. They usually just dig a hole or hide somewhere under something to prevent desiccation. But during the day, we can actually get a very good just walk right up to them, um, kind of dig down until we could see their, um, their radio antenna and get an exact precise location. And they moderately maybe selected a little woody debris. It is crossing zero, but, but not by a lot. Uh, but they were avoiding bare ground. And they were also using these other habitat characteristics as well. So, all in all, uh, based on our results, sorry, um, the ground drilling wildlife were not responding to current levels of woody biomass harvest. <clears throat> However, um, at this point, all sites did retain over three times the volume um, of debris than the Forest Guild recommends. So they recommend for coastal, for southeastern coastal pine forests. I think one ton per acre, and we had three to four tons per acre, even on the site that, that had a woody biomass harvest. So again, here's a site with, that um, had a complete woody biomass harvest, and there's still quite a bit of debris on the forest floor. Now, biomass harvesting is really only really part of the overall disturbance event. Um, let's see. So I mean, the, the largest disturbance event here is, is definitely the clear-cut harvest and the site preparation. Um, There's definitely the, the dominant disturbance events, and they, they've already kind of shifted the seral stages, the vegetation, 
and probably some of the wildlife that are that are there to be captured. Um, and this has been going on, you know, for decades. This, these clear cuts and uh, site preparation activities. <clears throat> so also we found that vegetation was the primary driver of shrew response. So you know we didn't see hardly any any of the woody debris metrics that came up as significant for um, for shrew captures. But the vegetation they were the shrews became very well established in 2013 along with the vegetation. And you see here, this is basically what the vegetation looked like in 2013. You could, you remember the one where it looked like in 2011, it was pretty barren with, without any vegetation, just woody debris. But in 2013, the vegetation was very thick, and that's when we began capturing a lot more shrews. Also, there were um, different site preparation activities between North Carolina and Georgia. I think it's very important because um, Basically, these these sites were were V sheared and wind road and spot piled before any wildlife sampling took place. So, if you remember, we had these treatments that were either scattered, where the debris was supposed to be retained scattered throughout the site, as many biomass harvesting guidelines recommend, and then we had the cluster treatment. So, these different site preparation activities um, not only could make the wildlife respond differently, but also um, these are things that we need to consider if if the biomass harvesting guidelines are to be developed. I think this is a very important consideration of when the site preparation is going to take place because um, that's definitely going to uh, definitely going to affect the distribution of 40 debris. So here we have the site prep in Georgia where it was wind road and the debris piles are pretty far away from each other. So definitely it could alter the responses of wildlife if we found responses. So basically here in the southeast we you know wildlife just may have adapted to low volumes of down woody material. These are southeastern coastal forests um, that you know historically have been maintained by regular fires. Also the decay rate is pretty high. So these forests don't have as much down woody material or as high as great of volumes of down woody material as other forests, such as maybe in the Pacific Northwest, even naturally. So I think the wildlife may have just adapted to low volumes of down woody material by these frequent um, fires, coupled with the rapid decay rates of woody material in this region. And kind of going back to the um, what we mentioned about the, the clear cut being the dominant and clear cut and site preparation being the, the dominant disturbance activity. You know, most of the species that we're going to catch here out there, because these areas have been clear cut and site prepped for so long, are going to be disturbance adapted species. Um, you know, southern toads are are known to be pretty hardy toads. They they are terrestrial toads, and that definitely um, that was the over five or like five thousand captures. Sixty percent of our captures were actually southern toads. So most of what we're capturing out there are already disturbance adapted. And they're mostly generalists as well. So again, here's a picture of the southern toads. So um, you know, it was just toad after toad out there. This is actually a picture from one bucket, one trap. And so we weigh them individually and measure them and then um, set them free again. But you see, I mean, they were they were everywhere. Lots and lots of southern toads. So for the next steps, one thing um, you know that may be important. Uh, we're not really seeing the wildlife response at this point, but something that could be important is to monitor technology and efficiencies of harvest. And this goes back to the amount of debris that was retained on the forest floor in areas with a woody biomass harvest. There is still a lot of debris left out there, whether it was inefficient based on the machinery or based on the cost to go and collect that way debris, um, you know, that could change in the future. Uh, also, it might be important to look at other plant communities and physiographic provinces. However, we do believe that you know, we were in the right place at the right time. This is just a, um, a map from the Southern Environmental Law Center that shows you know, we were on the coastal plain right here in North Carolina and right here in Georgia, and this is the area that that um, is booming with woody biomass facilities and proposed woody biomass facilities. 
although there are a few in the mountains and Piedmont as well, the majority are you know, right in the coastal plain. So although there could be differences in other physiographic provinces, you know, with, with the main um, demand coming from this area, we think that that was probably the most important area to do the study. And then also maybe different site preparation activities. We had two different site preparation activities, the wind rowing and the spot piling, um, and the bee sharing with the North Carolina. So, you know, just to find out what different um, individuals or companies are doing and how that may alter uh, the, the debris on the landscape. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Sarah. That was terrific. A lot of a lot of good information found in that study. It's a very important study, and um, we did have one question typed in, and um, I won't try to pronounce the species Gastrophrine carolinensis and yes. Anna Anaxorus species. Yes. Uh, relatively resistant to desiccation. Did you notice declines? in other amphibian species that were present prior to the harvest that may be more sensitive to biomass harvest slash canopy removal? Sure. Um, so we actually didn't do a before after study for this particular study, but I could comment a little bit on, you know, what is there. Of course, we, we capture very few rannids, which are your true frogs. They're very, um, they're kind of your water frogs. Very few rannids, and we actually did capture a few tree frogs. We had tree frog types out there, and every once in a while we would capture a tree frog, um, and especially in 2013, but we even captured some in 2011 and 2012. So I can't talk directly on how this study affected um, any, any species that were present before, the before it was harvested because we didn't do the before and after. But I will say that our third most commonly captured species, which was another um, Seven or eight percent of all herp species captured, or herp individuals captured, and it was um, the southern leopard frog. But they were all very recent metamorphs. So what we think was happening, and we captured a lot of them in, in um, some of the areas that were that were wetter. So we think that they were basically, um, you know, just going through the clear cuts and um, not there to stay. But other than that, large-bodied frogs. Could, could escape most of these traps, and they're going to be affiliated with water anyway, so those weren't really our focus. Okay, thank you. And Sarah, just mm -hmm. to follow up on that, um, I would, I'm just assuming that the reason you didn't do a before harvest survey to compare to after is because we already know that the species uh, mix would differ. Is that, is that why you didn't do it, or? Exactly. So there are a lot of different um, experiments out there. You know, we have the leaf experiments that are going on. A lot of other researchers have looked at maybe different harvesting, different types of canopy removal, like shelter wood, clear cut on amphibian and reptile, shrew populations. But that wasn't, really wasn't our, our um, interest here. We really just wanted to look at, um, at the volume of woody debris and what's going to happen on an operational scale with the clear cut and woody, and woody biomass harvest. So instead of having that somewhat of a control, which is a non-harvested area, we, we more use the no biomass mm -hmm. harvest as the control, um, but okay. still we thought it was important to have the large disturbance, the clear cut and site preparation disturbance. Okay, great. Thank you. So Jeff Hall has a question. Jeff asks, did you note any differences in species richness across sites or treatments and or treatments? Um, no, not too much. I, I need to go back in and look at that a little bit more detail, particularly in Georgia. But um, overall, no. We did have, you know, every once in a while we would capture um, something that, such as like a, a ringneck snake or some kind of fossorial small body snake. Um, and the captures were so few, maybe two or three for all three years. Um, so there might be a few differences there, but, um, but I wouldn't say that we saw uh, any patterns where we captured a lot of any species, so like, you know, I guess more the diversity, um, in one treatment over another. And definitely not on a treatment scale. Um, so yeah, there were some areas where we know we had maybe a couple more worm snakes or earth snakes or ring snakes, but those weren't, um, those weren't 
that that trend was not in each of the replications. It was just you know maybe a spot that was closer to um, you know some kind of habitat that they that they liked. I see. Okay. Thank you. Um, if sure. anyone has any more questions, please do type them in. Um, Sarah, do you think uh, that since you did all your field work in the summer, might there be any kind of seasonal effect um, on wildlife use, you know, in other seasons? Sure. Um, you know, that, that definitely could happen. Um, I think most of your reptiles and amphibians are going to be active when it's warm. These were during the breeding seasons. We know that um, you know our, our main our main species capture do breed basically through March through August. So we definitely wanted to open it up through that um, spring through the spring. However, when when we did sample, um, we usually start sampling the second week of April, and it honestly took two or three rounds of sampling before we were having almost any captures of anything. So. Um, we did see, you know, a little bit of a seasonal trend there. That in the in the actual summer we captured a lot more than in the spring. So I don't know that it would be. Okay. I mean, we definitely could go out there and, and, and trap in the winter, but I don't think we'd have a lot of capture success. Okay. Or as much capture success. Okay. Um, and was did any of your findings surprise you? Were were any of your findings, you know, not what you expected or? Um, you know, I guess based on the based on previous research, um, particularly with shrews, I really honestly didn't expect uh, expect um, to see a lot of differences in the reptiles, and we just didn't have very many reptile captures, anyways. Um, we have seen that uh, previous research has demonstrated that southern toads actually, in one study, selected clear cuts over forested habitat. Mm -hmm. So that didn't surprise me that they're out there um, in mass. Um, the, the southern toads. Um, now, sure, some of the previous research does uh, contradict itself. Like, there are some studies that show that shrews are linked to woody debris in the southeast, and that have found some positive results from um, experimental woody or, or positive or negative results with experimental woody debris manipulations or removal. Um, while other studies have shown that um, you know shrews are not responding to woody debris, so. If anything, I thought maybe the shrews would respond, but you know, there's all the previous research kind of shows a lot of different responses anyway. So I don't think anything really surprised me at all. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, we we are just about out of time, and I will ask Colleen to send out the um, link for the folks that would like to have okay. their continuing ed. But um, Sarah, thank you so much for presenting that information today. And again, if anyone would like more information on this study, on other aspects of it, or um, more information on Sarah's statistics, you can visit the project website, which I will type into the chat room here for you. Yeah, and feel free to email me as well if anyone has any um, questions, specific or otherwise. Um, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions. What is your email, Sarah? I can put it in here for the folks. It's fritz.sarah at gmail.com. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending. And have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone.